Welcome to Daybreak Star Radio Network. Our motto, our, our saying, what we're known for here is the only radio network officially indigenized in the airways. Another great day here, great vibe, great energy at the Daybreak Star Radio Network. And one of my favorite moments of the day is interviewing super cool people that aren't local, that are national, some of them are international. So today I'm joined by Ronnie the Blue-Eyed Native, our station producer. I'm Harris, station program director and on-air talent. And we're uh, honored here to talk to Matt Gilbert, who reached out to us. Uh, he's an author, among many other cool uh, attributes, and uh, reached out if we could do an interview with uh, Matt. And if we could first off, if you could uh, tell, uh, introduce yourself, please state your tribal affiliation and uh, let our listeners know about you, and then we'll get into it. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Matt Gilbert. I said, uh, how are you? My name is Matt um, Gilbert. Um, Quichin, not the Baskin. Um, Netsai Quichin, um, particularly, uh, um, um, I think Netsai means far away. Uh, our community is uh, pretty remote. And um, yeah, I just grew up in Northern Alaska, but always been a dreamer, you know, and uh, I've been around and went to school in um, high school in Reno and uh, college in California. So I'm a little cultured, you know, uh, in the low 48. <laughs> so, uh, um, but I um, always came back home because um, this always seemed the place where there was like the biggest things to do, you know, for me, um, like down there, I just be another business guy or another, um, another person, but up here, uh, I do great things, you know, and it's all explained in my memoir. Uh, I don't want to go on about it because it's going to take all day. Uh, but uh, uh, I kind of calmed down in my 30s, though, and I thought I finally put my degree to use. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. I spent my 20s, like, involved in politics and try trying to help my tribe and being a tribal leader. And I was actually working uh the height of that was me working in washington dc you know that was pretty cool but um i could have had a good career with that if i quit and came back and um what was i gonna say so um in my 30s i got into writing uh rose got i got really poor doing it too um because it doesn't pay but um i uh, I got an English degree in literature and rhetoric, and uh, I've always wanted to be a writer, so that's what I did in my 30s, and now in my 40s, everything's done, everything's published. Uh, holy crap, it took a lot of work, but uh, everything's published, and I'm just trying to get it out to Indian country, you know, which I'm learning uh, promotion and distribution of my work is uh, a whole other monster. It's a... <laughs> Um, whole other animal, whole other, big whole other campaign. I'm I'm painfully finding out, you know, getting my book out there. Yeah. So if you could, since you are from, you know, in Alaska up there and the Northern tribes and stuff like that, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience, you know, coming from Alaska and then, you know, you've traveled a lot of places from Albuquerque, New York, you know, and, you know, all of that. Can you tell us a bit more about those experiences you've had? Yeah, uh, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of really um, famous, way more famous than me, way more accomplished than me, filmmakers and writers, Alaska Native, that uh, went to NYU. One teaches at NYU, um, Andrew McLean. He made some really great films that was actually shown in the movie theaters here. And Martin Sensmeyer's from here. You know, I went to school with him, actually. I, I didn't meet him, but, you know, went to UAA at the same time. So um, I'm no... I'm, Something special or different. Oh, don't say that. Oh, we're breaking. Are we losing you? Stories, you know. But um, I went to Albuquerque to try. Sorry, one second. This res internet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, so Albuquerque. Um, I was trying to make it into film there. 
but then I made the mistake of trying to use somebody else's screenplay. I thought he was cool. Uh, well, we, 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 we were cool, but on a whim, he like pulled it. So from that day onward, um, I only try to make my own films. Uh, and then in New York, I was trying to get my books all um, published and known. Uh, I did do a reading at the American Indian House but it was a rainy December night and uh, not a lot of people showed up in Manhattan. But um, yeah, I went from all the way from this, this little remote village all the way to Manhattan to do a reading. So I've uh, been around. Um, still, obviously, I still haven't made it. Um, unfortunately, uh, story of my life, you know, bad luck. I don't want to say bad luck, but I just happened to get like knowing my books and my screenplays all finished and out there in a time when movies are kind of dying and uh, <laughs> and um, books are really um, uh, um, really dying too. I, I, I hate to say it, you know, because a lot of people are in video, YouTube, uh, uh, content creators, um, so video, video, video everywhere now. And uh, uh, so it's hard to it's hard to promote written literary stuff in a time like this, you know? Yeah. Cause most yeah. people I've, I've noticed like a lot of people just trying to write books just so they hope they can get it picked up as a screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote screenplays separate from a book, my books too. So. Nice. Thank you. So let's, uh, this is a two part question, Matt. What were some of your notable projects that you would like to highlight and showcase? you know, during your, during your travels, during your visits? And secondly, uh, how would you say um, your indigenous um, background has influenced your work as a writer, filmmaker, and musician? Well, that's a real loaded question. Probably like most modern indigenous people, it informs it in ways that makes it unique and makes it uh, different and uh, a lot of people don't get our storytelling, you know, like um, the trilogy of the, the sci-fi trilogy, Chandera is the one I wrote, the three-part trilogy that's out right now. That's the one I'm trying, that that was the main motivation of me getting a hold of you guys about. Um, I wanted to try to get that out to Indian country because growing up uh, here, um, I grew up in this house partly. I didn't see any Native American heroes that I, I want to see, you know, I mean, there were plenty of the, the old time ones, you know, but um, I knew there, I knew we had modern ones, you know, and, uh, I, I had to, um, sadly I found them in I, real life, but I didn't find them in the movies or stories, you know, like I met a Navajo airliner jet uh, pilot and, uh, I met Native American investment bankers and stuff. And these really wonderful, remarkable Native people, uh, heroes, you know, that I wish I knew when I was a kid, um, like like what like a guy from here became a NASA engineer. So I, in real life, I I see really awesome Native heroes, but I didn't see them in books or in movies though. You know, I'm like, why can't movies or books re reflect uh, reflect these people? You know, and so um, uh, I looked through uh, since I was 14, I, I browsed through book bookstores looking for a good Native sci-fi book, you know, with Native Native people in the lead. Didn't find nothing. And so when I was 15 years old, uh, I got tired of waiting and I came up with this really cool story. And uh, and then um, I gave our people even more chances. I like, <laughs> and then by the time I was 18, I was like, okay, they're still not doing it. So I'm gonna write, work on this story more. And uh, I did. And, um, and then a um, couple of years after that, I had big piles of notes and uh, Lord of the Rings came out and just, changed everything about fantasy and just pushed it and I was like okay wow this is I really have to write it now and so I wrote like a rough draft and my friend said it wasn't ready and he said you know grow a little bit more as a writer before you do because that's a really cool story and I want you to tell it but you know grow as a writer first and I did I, I waited another 10 years and then um around 2010 um um I was parked outside of Barnes and Nobles with an actor friend of mine, and I told him about that sci-fi series. And I said, "It's been collecting dust, you know." Uh, and then he, and uh, that's when New Moon was out, and Avatar was a big hit, you know. And he pointed to the movie posters on the wall of Barnes and Nobles. He said, 
indigenous sci-fi is right now you know look 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 at those poses it's like it's happening right now so put like write your book now and so i was like you are so right i'm gonna go do that and i did that and uh i uh wrote it and um yeah uh <laughs> and then it took another 10 years to uh perfect it and put it out you know and so now it's out but geez louise i didn't know books took like 30 years to write you know <laughs> put some time behind it <laughs> what was that you've put some time behind it definitely i i took a lot of time behind it well only because i kept getting pulled away you know uh, by responsibilities to the tribe um by me not wanting to do it you know i there actually but like i said i was forced into it because that nobody told the stories i wanted to tell you know <clears throat> and there's also i re really quick there's also a screenplay I wrote um, for an actress friend of mine, Native American actress friend of mine in New York called The Swan House about a Shawnee hillbilly woman in 1953, West Virginia. And it's about the termination era. And because um, a lot of people don't know about that part of American history, you know, because she did a lot of period films and she inspired me. That's what I went for to make that film. Um, I really, really want to make that film too, really badly. <laughs> Uh, that yeah so though these two books are the screenplay in this trilogy are what I'm trying to promote the most right now in terms of your trilogy well the movie sounds really awesome by the way um, I know everybody says that every doesn't matter what race creed um, doesn't matter what age lifestyle I mentioned that the, the log line in that movie right away light up like a Christmas tree when's it coming out when is it coming out I'm like <laughs> I'm trying to make it you know so it's in terms of your trilogy, though, um, which I'm actually looking forward to reading, I'm, I haven't yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm curious as what specific themes or like elements you use from Gwich and culture inside of that trilogy. Like, did you use a lot or did you pull from other tribes, too? Or was, you know, how'd you go about it? Um, yeah, um, I, I finished my thesis, which was a translation of elder stories of up here. Um, that's going to get published by my local university press too. I just, I'm just burnt out with it. I don't know when I'll, fin <laughs> it's finished, but um, they want me to do some edits and uh, I'm trying to retire actually. I'm trying to get back and try to get into music. Like I got, got a keyboard there and I uh, want to get into film, make my films instead, you know, because um, I got most of the books I want to write written and out, you know, however, <clears throat> anyways, uh, um, it influenced it a lot, um, like um, instead, like the book takes place in a medieval kingdom type place, but uh, I thought I put indigenous people there and I put a lot of elements of uh, what I found out from our old stories into those indigenous uh, elements of the story, you know, like like the um, the aroma, the village, the strong forest smell and uh, the way they talk, their ling linguistics, you know, because I learned about a lot about linguistics when I was translating the old stories, because uh, not a lot of people, <clears throat> I didn't know native language changes, you know, uh, like uh, the way my great grandfather speaks Gwich'in is completely different from the way my mom speaks it, you know, like the way my mom speaks it is really influenced by English. Um, so um, that like just small stuff like that, you know, and um, it's interesting, like, for example, when Max gets kidnapped by an indigenous tribe and he's thrown in their jail because there's no, he, he, he can't reach the uh, interpret, he can't reach the translation box, even though he's indigenous and he's cool and they're cool, they know that, you know, but they still don't trust him, you know, <clears throat> so he, he's trying to reach for the uh, translation box and he can't because they're, they have an um, under guard and uh, this uh, non- this non non native woman read that part, and um, when they let him go, and they they moved him to a house for a house arrest, he um he goes to sleep really happy, you know, because um, he knows he's uh you know, um, uh, he knows he's from the twenty fourth century and all that stuff, and so this non native. I'll just tell the story. I'll explain a lot. This little story. This non native woman that read that part. She was a uh, or a critic in New York. She said. Why would he be so calm when um, he's a prisoner of these people? And and uh, <laughs> I, uh, and uh, so I had to go back in there and I had to add something to explain that because he's indigenous and they're indigenous, so he knows they're not going to kill him. He knows, you know, like they're natives like him. He knows they're cool, you know. 
he knows he's okay, you know? Mm. Uh, see, they didn't understand that non-native, so I had to, like, add that in, you know? And uh, I... Uh, there's really little subtle differences between native heroes and Western heroes. I didn't even know until people told me that read Trandira. For example, um, do you, you realize your your hero he sleeps late a lot, right? Because <laughs> his girlfriend's gone by the time he's up all the time. And then when he rides in a battle, he doesn't yell. He's like quiet, right? When he rides into battle with the knights, whereas like if it was a white guy, he'd be yelling and you know going like that and. Um, I didn't know that until people told me. I was like, wow, you're so, you have a point there. <laughs> I didn't see the subtle differences until, hmm. you know, afterwards. As a former uh, journalist and instructor, what would you say, and could be one, two things, whatever, you're, whatever, whatever you'd like to share, motivated you to ultimately transition into becoming a writer and a filmmaker. And uh, in addition to that, how do you feel your previous experiences have shaped your current artistic pursuits? Um, um, the first one I kind of answered already. It's um, I was kind of, I feel like it chose me. I didn't choose it, you know? I feel like, um, I, I don't like using this word, but I feel like I was forced into it because like I said, I don't see the native stories out there. I want I want to see it. If I want to see it, then that means that probably means a lot of native kids want to see it too, you know? And um, um, I just want to do something about that severe scarcity of uh, really great modern native heroes. We're, there, we're start, there's starting to be some like um, Olivia Roanhorse's uh, Sci-fi trilogy, Black Sun, you know, it won the mm. novella. Yeah, it won the novella for it, you know, and um, and Kamina Drummer on the Expanse, that Native American ship captain. That that was pretty cool, you know. Um, so I think they're starting to come into sci-fi, but uh, it's still not quick enough for me. And I want these stories out there. And the second question was, um, uh. <clears throat> I really want to make it along with like a lot of like um, actors and uh, filmmakers my age, you know, like now they have white hair and I have white hair and I'm like, why it takes so long, you know, <laughs> why didn't I get into it when I was in my 20s, you know, uh, but then um, uh, I realized uh, a lot of the real life experience I had in tribal politics and um, just all the tragedies and um, joys and uh, normal life stuff that I went through, it really made me a way better storyteller, you know? It made me a way, way better storyteller. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think some people got late starts, you know, like um, like one of my role models is Alan Rickman, the late British actor. He didn't get his break until he was like 44, like, well, like my, mm -hmm. my age, 43, when he played Hans Gruber in Die Hard, yep. you know? He, yeah, he had a really late break, but he made up for it, you know, by being one of the best villains ever. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. He, yeah. He's played some amazing roles. He played, yeah, he played amazing roles during his time. Yeah, and also uh, Native American actors, Wes Studi and um, I forgot somebody else, but Wes Studi, he didn't get into acting until he was like in his late 30s or something, you know? So um, so my, my answer to your question is uh, um, I'm glad um part of me will always be sad i didn't make it sooner but i mean but uh, another part of me uh i'm glad i could use these real world experiences to form art you know make the art stronger yeah thank you so um a question that we got from our station manager because she was curious um you've done a lot of you know guest speakers at um among classes and colleges and stuff like that she wanted to know if you have any memorable memorable experiences doing that. You know, I mean, major things happen, or I guess, <laughs> yeah. or like no, how was studying at and she wanted to know how studying at Oxford was too, and how it impacted your journey. Wow, um, about things happening during the lecture. Not, no, there, nothing really happened. There's normal lectures, you know, mm. uh, norm. Um, very mundane questions and stuff, you know, and uh, <laughs> just, yeah, just, yeah, uh, nothing, nothing there. There's normal lectures, you know, 
But uh, studying at Oxford, uh, that definitely informed Chandira a lot, you know, like because I was an indigenous person thrust into that, like, uh, it looked very much like Harry Potter, like Hogwarts, you know, it was very <laughs> much, it was very much like that. I felt like I was at Hogwarts and, and uh, I used it, you know, like I'm, I'm a very practical minded person, you know, when it comes to my writing. So when the characters reach Densmere Kingdom and Chandira with the native guy in the lead, um, a lot of my experience at Oxford, I put it in there, you know, because it's heavily Western medieval Europe type, you know, culture, you know uh like the feeling and stuff i had him go through that you know hmm. nice thank you yeah. um if you want to briefly describe for us please some of the challenges and rewards of teaching these subjects for you and how you faced any specific challenges or obstacles as a writer <laughs> filmmaker and musician and how you've overcome those the, just say the first part again teaching yeah, uh, just some of the challenges and rewards of teaching these subjects oh, and geez. how you faced any specific challenges or obstacles as a writer, filmmaker, and musician, and how you've overcome them. Uh, teaching, not a lot of obstacles. Uh, I, I didn't teach art and stuff. I mostly taught like English and uh, even my native language once, even though I can't speak it that well. There wasn't... Just the normal teaching challenges of trying to get kids to pay attention and um, um, trying to care, you know, like uh, I'll just tell you one story. They did a, um, they actually did Macbeth in Gwichin in the in Fairbanks one year, which was really awesome. Um, um, and so that following uh, that following spring, I was teaching Gwichin to, uh, and all the kids weren't interested, you know. They're like, we we don't want to learn the language. We just want to sit here and wait for the next class. You know, um, that's a they didn't say that, but they 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 inferred that in. Um, and I couldn't get them interested, you know. Uh, and so uh finally I said, you know, there's actually um I, I went to a play, a Gwichin play in Ape Fairbanks, and there was a bunch of like white people speaking your language fluently, and uh doesn't that embarrass you? And then uh, they're like, whoa, you know, and they all just sat up and they just started paying attention. <laughs> it worked. It worked. I got them interested, you know, that worked. I got them interested. So that was probably my most successful teaching story, becoming a challenge, you know, just apathy, you know, with res kids in particular. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, the second question was um, uh, challenges as an artist. Uh, I didn't know it was complicated i thought like you know i always believed all those movies of um the artist making it overnight you know like bam you're over your big star uh, it it doesn't work like that um mm. secondly um uh i didn't know that breaking in wasn't like um simple you know like some people will try to uh force you to compromise some people will try to rip you off some people will um um, there's a lot of fake posers out there, you know, people that say they have connections, but don't, you know, and so um, I didn't know it was going to be so complicated and frustrating, you know, I thought it was going to be simple, I thought, like, if I just meet the right person, bam, I'm big, you know, but it it doesn't work like that, it's a long road, you know, it's a long road, and it's uh, very frustrating, and I'm still on it, too, and for example, uh, Chandera, um, a, a local publisher here was going to pick it up, it would, he said he had worldwide market distribution. Um, uh, he was going to pay my way to Las Vegas to Comic Con, and this was during the pandemic, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, so he gave me a two thousand dollar royalty check. Um, his editor from New York fixed the novel, but um, I, I read the man. Lucky I did this. I read the novel before they put it out, and they they they, they took out so many amazing scenes, and especially Alex's scenes, the leading lady. Um, I, 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 what got me to really focus on Chandira in, um, 2010, other than that guy telling me to the outside Barnes and Wesley, outside Barnes and Nobles was also the hairdresser broke my heart. <laughs> and, um, oh, no. I, wanted, I, I escaped, I know I, I escaped into the book to escape that. And, uh, so I really took a lot of comfort in Alex and Max's 
romantic relationship because I wasn't having a good one, you know? And so um, in a way she kind of, um, she kind of saved me. She did not saved me, but she really comforted me when uh, this fictional woman, when no real life woman did. And so when, um, when this publisher and his New York friend took a lot of her scenes out, I wouldn't compromise because she meant a lot to me, even though she doesn't exist, you know, she still meant a lot to me. I said, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I just, I, I can't take these scenes out. Then he, then he wouldn't compromise. I wouldn't compromise. And then we ended up splitting ways and I, I tried to give him the royalty back, but he told me to keep it. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, they don't that, usually that, do that. that. <laughs> what was that? They don't usually do that. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, wow, I'm lucky, you know. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that story right there tells you it's not it's not that simple, you know. Like, for example, there was a, a producer in New York that wanted to make the Swan House. He fell in love with it right away. You know, I showed him the script. But um, he, his production company was smaller and he wanted to fake a lot of the West Virginia scenes in New York. And he wanted an, um, the um, kind of an Asian woman to play the lead and didn't want my Native American actress there. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. I, I was sitting in the big mansion too. And I was like, I understand like he said, we could get this done in a month and then two months we could get it to Sundance, you know? And I was like, yeah, but I, I I can't compromise on that. I want to shoot it actually in Hinton, West Virginia. And I want my my native actress to play the lead. And he said, well, we're going to have to split ways. And I was like, okay, you know, sorry. And I walked out. And so those two stories should tell you guys how complicated it is to break in. You know, I, I just, I wouldn't compromise. I just don't want to compromise because that's how heartbroken I was as a kid. How sad I was as a kid in front of the TV, not seeing the native hero as I wanted to see, you know? And uh, my friend, my friend, uh, she was helping me with uh, some stuff with the movie, uh, I forgot her name, shoot. I haven't talked in a while, Sabrina, yeah. She said to me, I told her those story, what I, the story that I just told you guys about the publisher and uh, producer. And she said, um, yeah, Matt, um, that's why a lot of our people don't make it. And that's why a lot of our stories aren't told the way we want it because, you know, they end up compromising, you know, like uh, yep. when you didn't, they ended up doing it, you know, because they want to make it so bad. I, I was like, wow, you might have a point there, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one last question we got for you. And I want to know what advice would you give to young native uh, filmmakers, writers, artists, just trying to, you know, get into this business man uh, get ready for a really long hard road you know yeah i mean once in a great while someone will make it quickly you know but that's really that's the chances of you doing that really low you know? i mean yeah get ready for a long hard road and you better really like it i mean you better you better want it more than anything you know uh, it's definitely something you can't do part time. Yeah. Because um, when I was doing my book signings, uh, every single person that came up said, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, I wrote part of a book. You know, I've been I'm planning to write a book. So um, most people don't write, write a book that they always want to write. Uh, probably 25% of people actually do write a book. Um, or maybe 40%. Well, during the pandemic, it was probably 40% people <laughs> write a book. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and then, probably 25% of people get it edited good enough to send to a publisher. And probably 10-5% get, uh, get published. And probably 5% it's a little bit in return, like maybe five ten skills you know beyond their family and friends <laughs> and only like two or three percent become like stephen king or uh, jk rowling you know yeah so um extremely extremely hard and uh they said the average age was 40 to get published and uh, i wanted to prove them wrong so i tried really hard 
uh, I haven't got like medical issues so hard. Only like two, three or four percent of yeah. writers become J.K. Rowling or Stephen King. Right, right. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, average age of publishing is over 40. I like I tried to prove that wrong, but it, um, I didn't. I got a medical problem, tried to do it because I got stressed out so much. Um, uh, so it take, it shows you how long it takes, you know, for most people. Um, there are those exceptions like Tommy Warren, she got published, uh, won awards when he was like 28, but that's, that's an exception. You know, I mean, uh, most people, it takes a really long time. Yeah. Just keep at it. Just keep at it.